Most cycling fans have that specific moment that they cherish for all of time. For the older generation, it could be Lance Armstrong's The Look on Alpe d'Huez, or Bjorn Reese throwing his very expensive bike into a field. For the younger generation, in which I see myself in, it could be Alberto Contador putting down the final statement on Lance Armstrong in the tour, or Tommy Wachler fighting to keep a hold of the yellow jersey, or as recent, Julian Alaphilippe. In this video, we'll dive deep and analyze one of the most epic recent iconic moments in cycling. The day that Chris Froome did the impossible. Before we take a look at the day where Chris Froome did the impossible, if you enjoy this video and if you enjoy the content here on CPCN, we urge you to click the subscribe button and also click the notification button. Monday through Friday, we give you all the news in cycling, and then on Saturdays and Sundays, we give you special videos like this. So if you do end up enjoying this video, please consider clicking the subscribe button below. The 2018 Giro d'Italia did not start according to plan for Chris Froome start of the Giro over in Jerusalem, I had uh, crashed in the, in the recon of the time trial before the race had even begun. Some crashes you get up from and brush it off and you're fine, um, but this one, I wasn't right. I wasn't right and I felt for, the, for at least the first 10 days of the race, I just wasn't myself. I felt out of balance, out of sync, and I, I was hemorrhaging time. I was, I was losing time at every opportunity pretty much. The crash in Jerusalem saw him lose 37 seconds to pre-race favorite Tom Dumoulin, and he proceeded to lose another 17 seconds on stage 4. Things weren't looking good for Chris, especially since his countryman Simon Yates of Michelin Scott was running away with the show, becoming seemingly more and more invincible with every pedal stroke. As the days and stages passed, Chris Froome looked significantly wounded from his crash in Jerusalem, slipping down the overall rankings, bleeding time on stages where a potential winner wouldn't. Frankly, coming into the 14th stage of the Giro d'Italia, most people had ridden off Chris Froome as he was sitting in 12th place a whole 3 minutes and 20 seconds down on Maglia Rosa holder Simon Yates. But everything was about to change. Or was it? Mont saint colin is widely regarded as one of the toughest climbs in all of cycling. The unforgiving gradients have seen some great battles fought, and adding to that list would be Simon Yates versus Chris Froome. There is a consensus of cycling experts and pundits around the world that if Chris Froome was to turn around this Giro d'Italia, it'd be on Mont saint colin It's essentially time for Chris Froome to reveal which cards he'd been holding the entire time. Unfortunately for the rest of the peloton, he'd been holding aces but they wouldn't quite know that on stage 14. As the peloton entered the slopes of the grueling climb, the shape of Chris Froome, which had until this point been hiding at the back, was coming ever so closer to the front. His trusty lieutenant, Wout Pauls, was setting a fast pace in the front, which saw the likes of Tom Dumoulin in trouble early on. Once Wout Pauls swung over, it was time to unleash Chris Froome, and with his trademark washing machine cadence, he attacked. Suddenly the Chris Froome that everyone had come to expect was on full display, on arguably the most prestigious climb of the 2018 Giro d'Italia. Chris Froome was making a statement. Chris managed to take back 37 seconds on Tom Dumoulin, but only a mere 6 seconds on Simon Yates. Despite the heroic effort, it still didn't look great for the Team Sky captain. To make matters even worse, Chris would pay for his efforts the very next day and lose a minute and 32 seconds to Simon Yates and 50 seconds to Tom Dumoulin. At this point, 4 minutes and 52 seconds behind Simon Yates, it all looked pretty much over. I found myself coming into stage 19 over 3 minutes down and I knew it would take something absolutely crazy to, to turn the race upside down and it would be a kind of move of almost a suicide move, it would be all or nothing. That idea of going solo 80Ks out was uh, a decision I made in the morning before the race. I sent a message to my coach, Tim Kerrison, and just said to him, it's a bit of a, bit of a crazy move, but what do you think if I went 80Ks out? 
prior to this day, only a select group of riders had stamped their tickets to All or Nothingville in a grand tour and succeeded. Nara Quintana in the Giro d'Italia 2014 on stage 16, attacking on the Stelvio in the snow, dropping everyone except for Roland and Hesherdal. Andy Slack in the 2011 Tour de France on stage 18, which arguably is one of the greatest days in professional cycling, where Andy attacked on the Col de Isoard and didn't look back. And most famously, Floyd Landis in the Tour de France, soloing for over 127 kilometers, dropping every single GC contender. There's only three climbs, two descents. It's going to be a time trial, and behind, they could have to sort out a really good chase if, if they wanted to catch me, I mean. And he replied, and his reply was a little bit along the lines of, he didn't say no, but he said, listen, it didn't take a lot of work to, to do something like that. What Chris Froome set out to do that morning is widely regarded as impossible. But was it really impossible? The more you think about the strategy in the Team Sky bus that morning, the more it makes sense. Chris had nothing to lose and everything to gain. Especially with Simon Yates starting to feel the strain on his body from dominating two and a half weeks of the Giro and Tom Dumoulin needed to be distanced in order to move up. If the attempt on the Maglia Rosa from Chris Froome was to end in a blaze of glory, at least he went down swinging knowing he gave everything he had. Certainly there were doubts. It's something that could go completely wrong and you know what, if, you, if it doesn't work out then you lose everything. But on the other side, um, I was also thinking about it as, well, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling better in myself now. I'm going to get out there and go into time trial mode. As things developed out on the road, Simon Yates had started dropping. He's this right near the back, Yates, you know pink what? jersey. That's not good, that's not good. We hit the foot of the, the Finestra and the team. I asked the guys to, to ramp it up through all the hairpins earlier on and make the race harder and harder. So for, for the guys further back, it would have been quite tough already. They're racing this, they're not just riding tempo, they're actually, they're attacking, they are racing this climb at the top on the hardest section now. Yates was dropped, Dumoulin had started losing teammates already. And I think only at that point did I, did I really believe, okay, I'm going to do this now. This is the moment. It's, it's now or never. Through now, he goes on the offensive. He goes on the attack over the top of this final climb, and nobody at the moment can go with him. It was just an amazing feeling to see that Dumoulin and the other GC guys they want on me. That that was that was where the the time trial started. When Chris distanced his biggest competitor, Tom Dumoulin, he was averaging 397 watts for 11 minutes and 3 seconds. Unfortunately, due to the circumstances of the high altitude and the weather during the stage, the Velen transponder wasn't able to provide more detailed analytics for the entire stage and Velen chose not to make Chris's heart rate data public. Once I accelerated and I saw no one come with me, I just thought, Stuff it. I'm gonna go for it now, all or nothing, and uh, get stuck into this. I wouldn't say I was taking risks on the descent, but I pushed on and went as fast as I could. I, it was just an amazing feeling to get to, to the bottom of the descent and into the next valley and just hear that the gap had opened up another 30, 40 seconds, just in, which is almost for free, if you like, because there's not really much pedaling to do on it, and it's more about the, the technique and the, the, the lines you take. As Chris Froome was taking back more and more time on the descent, the group of favourites behind struggled to get organised, or as Tom Dumoulin eloquently put it in a post-race interview, On my own, I can descend just as fast as Froome, but Reichenbach descends kind of like an old lady. As the race went on and that, that gap went up from one minute, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, and it was just like, wow, I'm now in, in, in reach of pink jersey and the, the overall lead of the race. It was becoming clearer and clearer. Chris Froome was about to pull off one of the greatest long-range attacks in the history of pro cycling. Being out in front just changed and, and gave me even more, I guess, to, to fight for. And that was, that was just such an incredible feeling. To sum up how most people feel about this stage, I'll let George Bennett of Jumbo Visma have the final word. Uh, did he stay away? Did, did Froome stay away? Man, you should know. I'll tell you all about it. He's in the, in the pink jersey right now. Bullshit. 40 seconds ahead of Dumoulin currently. Landis. 
<laughs> Jesus. Thank you so much for watching to this point of the video and if you've enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing to the channel as Vic, Chris and I put a lot of work into the content on a daily basis. If you want more content like this, do let us know in the comments down below and we'll do our best to get more interesting stories like this. It's been so much fun making this video and I hope to be back next week with another video like this. But until then, we'll see you.